What fantastic lyrics for us to sing on a morning like this. And you know, when the gospel opens your eyes, the Holy Spirit makes you aware how awful you really are. And that is when the gospel makes sense for the first time. And it is often when we grow in Christ that we look back even through a song like we just sang and see how awful we truly were before a holy God. And I don't know about you, but thinking about my own life, when I see sin in my life and recognize what I would be apart from Christ, we can look back and just give thanks all over again. I want to welcome you this morning to Grace Bible Church. So glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us for the first time, this is a unique Sunday. This is a baptism and membership Sunday for us. Um, you've kind of dropped in on what is a kind of a family morning and really special kind of in the history of our church every time we do this. And we want you to feel welcome as a visitor. We're glad that you're here. We have a gift we want to give you. It's a book. It's available at the information table by the glass doors on your way out today. You can stop by and just fellowship with us, interact with us, ask any questions at the info table that you'd like. But we'd love to be able to give you a gift just as a way of saying thank you for being here today. Additionally, there's a perforated section of the bulletin you received on your way in. We would love it if you filled that out and tear it off and you can hand it to us at the information desk or you can drop it in one of the offering boxes at the back wall of this room on your way out. Well, this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28. And before we do that, I have some announcements to give you. I almost skipped over them and that would have been a disaster for all who said these are really important announcements, <laughs> like me. I wrote them down for myself. Uh, today, because it's uh, Baptism and Membership Sunday, we are having a grill-out lunch immediately following the service. If you did not prepare to eat with us, that's okay. We've got plenty of food for you. We'd love for you to stay, and uh, we'll be eating right here on campus. Uh, tonight, again, we have our evening service at 6 p.m., working our way through the book of Daniel. The doors open at 5 p.m. for fellowship. I want to tell you about next Sunday. Uh, equipping hour at 9 is uh, as usual. And then our main service at 1015 is our dedicated Christmas service. We'll be focusing on the incarnation of Christ. There will be no children's ministry for those three and up. So we're going to have everybody in here together, and we'll have the kids come forward for a, a kid's Christmas story and all the usual things we like to do on that Sunday closest to Christmas. That's next Sunday. And then Sunday evening next week on the 19th of December, We've got a celebration of music celebrating the Lord's birth, and Josh Kelso has been working hard to put together something new for us in the history of Grace Bible Church, a, a Sunday evening Christmas musical extravaganza. I don't know if he has a name for it yet, but we'll give it an acronym someday and call it something. Uh, but the normal worship band is going to be leading us in a lot of songs. We get to sing together as a body of believers. The youth musicians, youth band musicians, will also be leading us in that, and uh, there will be a children's choir for the first time in the history of Grace Bible Church. Um, follow all of that with hot chocolate and candy canes. It's an evening you do not want to miss. So that's 6 p.m. next Sunday night. And read the bulletin carefully for details on Christmas Eve service and all the other ministries going on. You've got your Bible open to Matthew 28. And I want to read the last three verses here. This is the Great Commission. This is Jesus commissioning his followers for the task they would take on to the end of the church age after Christ's departure. Jesus came up and spoke to them, verse 18, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the commissioning of disciple making, disciple making disciples, followers of Jesus who will reproduce themselves by creating more followers of Jesus, who will reproduce themselves by creating more followers of Jesus to all the nations, to the end of the age. And they are to make disciples going, baptizing, and teaching. They are to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are to teach them to observe all that Jesus commands. That is all the New Testament doctrine and teaching. 
And this morning for us is an exciting Sunday as eight followers of Christ are being baptized before us today. And baptism is, as you know, an outward symbol of an inward reality that has already taken place. These eight who are being baptized before you have already experienced and expressed repentance and faith. They have experienced death of the old self and a raising to new life. They are new creations already. They are excited to tell you about God's grace in their lives through Jesus Christ. And you'll hear from them, there, there is nothing that they have done to merit God's favor. There is nothing they could have done to increase his love for them or to assuage his wrath. It is the free grace of God through Jesus Christ that forgives. It is the free grace of God through Jesus Christ that transforms. It is the free grace of God through Jesus Christ that secures eternal life for all who believe. Baptism doesn't earn any merit or do anything religiously for people, but it is God's ordained means of publicly testifying to what God has already done in the heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has made them alive, granted them faith and repentance. He has brought about a new creation and a life being transformed by the power of his Spirit. They have all expressed faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for the payment of sins. That is, only Jesus' death in their place satisfies God's wrath against sin. They have repented from the old life, the old self, from sin as a way of life, from dead religious works, from the world, and they have turned to Christ, surrendering to him in faith, being transformed by his spirit. I'm going to get out of the way and let them tell you what God has done in their lives by his grace. And we get to hear their testimonies of the work of the gospel. We'll begin first with Stephanie Behar. Come and tell us what your Savior has done for you. Hello, my name is Stephanie Behar, and I would like to share how I come to be here today. I grew up in a oneness, charismatic church. I was baptized as a teenager because of a Sunday school lesson on salvation. The lesson included a step ladder as a prop. Step one, repent. Step two, be baptized. Step three, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by speaking in tongues. I agonized over not receiving that gift I did all the steps and good works. With this false gospel, I took the license to live in an immoral life of sin, repent and repeat. This would be the driving force for most of my life. Yet it would never be enough and salvation would be elusively out of reach. I cannot specifically say when it all changed, but I know the seeds of biblical truth have been planted throughout my life from people like my brother Steve, who has sought truth in scripture, and my sister-in-law April, who constantly, constantly represents God's grace, and all those countless times the gospel message was shared, which helped lead me to dive into scripture. Isaiah 64, four tells me my righteous works are filthy rags to a perfect God. Christ lived the perfect life because I could not. He took my sin and died in my place, Romans 1.5 states that we live out the obedience of faith through the grace we have, been, we have received. My baptism is an obedience with the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. I am no longer uncertain where I stand. I am made new through God's grace and not of my own. Stephanie, it is my privilege because of your testimony of faith in Jesus Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. 
Joel Smades, would you come boast in your Savior? Hi, I'm Joel Smades. I grew up in the church hearing many different times that Jesus was God and that he died on the cross for the world's sins. Without examining these statements, I, in my own childlike way, believe them. I was a difficult child. In many ways, I was rebellious. In other ways, I was just odd. Regardless, my behavior drew the eye of classmates, teachers, and even a principal or two. I was bullied by kids, beat up, made fun of, and even accused of being not all there. But I was well aware. Even at this young age, I had a notion about the universality of sin. As it says in Genesis 6, 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. I knew this about myself, and I knew that others were just like me, human. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But rather than turning to repentance, which I did not fully understand, I turned to a years-long hatred of other people. Yes, I hated the world, but in a self-righteous way. Yes, I hated the evil in others, but in a hypocritical way. I was bitter and spiteful, and most mind-numbing of all, prideful. I thought I was better than everyone, and in some way, I wanted to get back at them for all the wrongs they did to me. So I carried this idol with me for many years. I continued this course into my late teens. Though I went to church three times a week, I paid little attention, always investing myself in my own personal interest. Though these things were my future, these were always my hope to someday be successful at this or that passing obsession, as if it was some ticket to prove the world just how valuable I was. Though I thought so highly of myself, I couldn't save myself. As Peter states in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I put all my faith in myself, and whenever something I did didn't work, who did I have to fall back on myself? Inevitably, I was hopeless, and with hopelessness came depression. At times, I wished I could just fall over and die. One day during my senior year, I was as miserable as I had ever been. I wanted to get out of school so bad that day that I faked sick in class so my mom would take me home. So she did. She could tell something was wrong with me, and we started to talk. At the time, I didn't realize how significant this day would be, so I remember it poorly. But somehow the topic of sin and guilt came up in our discussion, and I was deeply convicted. My mom prayed with me, and I cried out to Jesus for forgiveness. I knew he could forgive sins, and I felt this great weight come off of me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Inexplicably, over the remaining school year, I was happy, and I had this strange curiosity in Christianity. What was this thing I grew up into all about, I thought? Who really was Jesus? I had many, many questions. I began reading articles and watching shows like Ray Comfort's Way of the Master. One article led to another, to another, to another. The more I read, the more I believed. Now I can say, as Peter said to our Lord in John 6, 6, 8, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. In contrast with my own self-exalting pride, 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. In contrast with the loveless, vengeful person that I was, Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In my sinful state, I deserved hell. 
But in contrast to me, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, of my perfect God, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In contrast of my hatred of others, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. When mankind fell into sin, the relationship between God and man was broken. When Christ was on the cross, he paid the debt we owed for our sins. Because God is perfectly good, he must punish sin, or else he would be unjust. But now, by the atoning work of Christ, our broken relationship with God can be restored. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For too many years, I didn't consider being officially baptized because I was baptized when I was a kid, and admittedly, I thought little about it. But now I feel convicted to be obedient to my Lord's command in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Joel, it's my privilege, because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now, Jolene. My name is Jolene Smades, and I am up here today to share how by the grace of God I was saved. Scripture says in Psalm 14, 2 through 3, that the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. This was a reality that I understood at a young age. I knew God hated sin and that I was full of sin. But I was born into a traditional Roman Catholic family. Growing up, I was taught that the triune God existed and that Jesus, who was part of the Trinity, had been sent to earth to pay the penalty for the sins of everyone who would believe in him. But I was also taught that it wasn't enough to believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but that I had to also follow all the Catholic Church laws and even then I was only guaranteed to enter purgatory when I died. As a result of this, I didn't have a full picture of God's character. I didn't know who he truly was, and I felt only the burden of my sinful state, no matter how good I tried to be. And at an early age, I felt hopeless without a way to become clean in God's eyes. I knew God's law, but had no idea how to access his grace and forgiveness in a way that provided relief. I was experiencing Romans 3, verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. I knew I was a sinful, fallen creature, offending my perfect and holy creator. Because of this, I believed in a version of God, full of wrath, expecting perfection, who gave no way to fulfill his demands. Even though Jesus had paid the penalty for sins, somehow that wasn't enough. I still needed to accomplish my own salvation through works and sacraments and by somehow staying sinless. Jesus was deaf to my prayers and pleas, so I was told to pray to the saints and Mary. It was as if after the cross, Jesus couldn't be bothered to help me any further. He had done his part, and I needed to do mine. 
Psalm 7, verse 15 says, A wicked man makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. I didn't know how to be reconciled to God, so I hardened my heart against him and accepted the grim reality that I was going to hell. I was in a pit, and I was only getting buried deeper. Because of this, I made a plan to enjoy what I could while still on earth, looking for happiness any way I could get it. Consequently, my years spent in middle and high school are a blur of incredibly bad decisions, with some events that I can't recall without a feeling of shame so deep that I only find relief by remembering God has forgiven me. When high school ended, I had no direction for my life and only a vague society-pleasing agenda in mind that I would take a year off and enter college afterward. I ended up traveling around the U.S. and lived in Seattle for four months before I ended up moving back home to Arizona. I had to move back into my mom's house and was under pressure to quickly find a job. At the time, my sister was employed at a home decor store, and she advised me to apply where she was working since they were always hiring somewhere in the store. And we also knew several people who already worked there. When I did apply, it was for the store in Chandler, but they didn't have any openings. It was this reason that I went on to apply at the Scottsdale location, despite it being a 30-minute drive from me and despite the fact that I didn't own a car. Fortunately, the Scottsdale location had a few openings, and when I was interviewed, I was offered a position in two different departments. I ended up picking the area where I knew one of the other coworkers through my sister. Now, I'm saying all this to display the immense power of God's providence because it was at this store and in that specific department where I met my husband. So at this point in my young life, I was well practiced at silencing my conscience if it ever did twinge. I was no longer searching for a way to know God and had even gone so far as to explore Buddhism and being spiritual. I had totally rejected the knowledge I had grown up with it was only at Christmas or Easter that Jesus would cross my mind again, just to be quickly forgotten in the commotion of festivities and family gatherings. This was the state I was in when I finally collided with God in a significant way. There I was at my new job for about seven to eight hours a day with nothing much to do except talk with my new coworker. It was through this extended exposure of one-on-one -on -one time that we became friends. We shared a lot of common interests and never seemed to run out of things we could discuss. I can't remember how, but one day we ended up talking about my Catholic past, and I was telling him how during the consecration of the communion bread, it became Christ's actual body. Thankfully, he was a Christian and was able to tell me with such assured confidence that I was incorrect, and he even gave me reasons for how he knew this. I was truly amazed. Here was someone who not only believed in God correctly, but also had answers for why he believed what he did. It was as if I stood in a pitch black room and someone had flicked a light switch on. The prophet Isaiah said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Maybe that was the moment my shackles fell off and I was shown that my dark room had an exit the whole time. I only needed God to show me the way out. It was enough of a revelation for me that I finally felt the weight of existential dread on my shoulders begin to lighten, to the point where I was actually eager to know more about God. Over the next few months, I had many opportunities to question my new friend about Catholic beliefs, questions about Jesus, about sin, etc. I was stunned to find out that what Jesus had done on the cross was sufficient payment for the totality of all my sins, and the only thing I had to do was believe in him. I was finally discovering the beautifully freeing text in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Soon after this incredible discovery, my coworker and I began dating. It was during this period that the Lord really worked on my heart and gave me an aversion for my sin. I was convicted by my boyfriend's lifestyle and choices, which made me look to Jesus even more for answers on how I should now conduct my life. 
Little by very little, I was enabled by the Lord and through the guidance of my husband to relinquish unrepentant sin in my life. And this I did gladly and with relief. I had discovered that by trusting in Jesus, I no longer was hopelessly cursed under God's law, but that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, Galatians 3.13. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. I was finally free to know and love God. The Lord used my husband in a mighty way to bring me the message of saving faith. I am so humbled when I contemplate everything God did to perfectly maneuver my steps that led me to faith in Christ. I am overwhelmed with awe when I think of my Creator choosing me to love Him and be loved by Him forever before the foundation of the world. I am getting baptized today because it is my honor and privilege to show the outward sign of an internal truth that my sins have been buried in Christ and I have been raised to new life with Him. Because of this great truth, I can say with the psalmist, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Jolene, because of your profession of faith in Christ, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mom and Dad, you did great. All right, Christian Zwicky, come on up and boast in your Savior. Hi, my name is Christian Zwicky. Uh, I'd like to testify to you today about what my Savior has done for me and the fate he rescued me from. I grew up in what I would describe as a God-friendly household. I was baptized as a newborn and at the age of four. There would be loose talk about God in a very ethereal way. When a pet died, I was told God would take that pet and it would be waiting for me in my house in heaven. I believed that if I prayed to God, he heard me. I thought I had a good relationship with God, but I had never gone to church and I never read the Bible. I heard the story of Noah, but I thought the point of that story was that he saved the animals. I didn't know the David from David and Goliath was the same person as King David. I had never heard of God's judgment or of my sin. I was always told I was a good kid, so I figured God agreed. Turns out I didn't know anything about God and I had completely invented my own theology to explain the world around me and validate my goodness. At one point, I believed Santa had been commissioned by God to go around the world and give presents to good children and that the appearance of presents every year was a confirmation of my goodness and that I would be heaven bound. And that may all sound amusing, but it was eternally serious. Uh, these weren't just harmless fantasies. It was a testament to how I had descended into idolatry and how lost I was even at a young age. Age is no barrier to wickedness. The Lord saved me from that darkness at the age of 12 in 2005. I was a huge baseball fan and my mom took me to a Dodger game against the Milwaukee Brewers in LA. We had seats next to the bullpen and the Brewers were in the basement as far as the standings went that year. So it wasn't a very well attended game. That gave me the opportunity to be able to talk to some of the bullpen players during the game. As you can imagine, I was starstruck as a 12 year old looking up at a six foot four ball player. One of the players signed my glove and under his signature he wrote John 3:16. Ecstatically, ecstatically, I went home at midnight after the game. I grabbed a dusty King James Bible from, uh, that we had at home, and I tried to find the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Growing up in America with heavy Christian iconography, I knew that Jesus died, but this was the first time I had any idea why he died or had heard of his relationship to God. When I read this verse, I believed it. It was a shocking truth, and I still didn't grasp why, why Jesus needed to die or how to believe in him, and I can't explain why I knew this verse to be true other than that the Lord opened my heart to hear. And this all raised a very important question. Now what do I do? Uh, I figured church wouldn't be a bad idea, so I asked my mom to take me to church the following Sunday. 
She took me to a Calvary chapel close to home, and at the end of the sermon, I first heard the full gospel and a call to repent and believe. I was at enmity with God, divided from him because of my sin, and the only way to repair my relationship with him was to repent of my sin, accept Christ as my savior, understanding that he died to cover the cost of my sin and to submit to him as Lord of my life. If I did those things, the Holy Spirit would come into my heart and I would be saved. I was really rattled to find out that God might be my enemy, and I immediately prayed in agreement with these things, hoping the Holy Spirit would come in. I repeated this prayer for a few months because I wasn't sure how to know if the Holy Spirit actually came in or not. Um, I asked for a Bible for Christmas, started in the book of Daniel because I heard uh, Daniel was the wise prophet and I figured wisdom would be important. Unfortunately, my mom stopped bringing me to church after about three occasions because she felt that the preaching was questioning her own salvation too much. So I spent much of the first nine years of my faith on my own, aside from briefly going to a Baptist youth service on Friday nights in high school. My early faith walk was characterized by a great zeal with no maturity and little knowledge. Uh, my early evangelism was very much in the spirit of James and John in Luke 9:54, where if you recall, they wanted to see a city be destroyed for rejecting Jesus. So there I was, a 12-year-old in middle school with a Bible in hand demanding people repent and being really upset when they didn't. I didn't know any better back then, but I'm really thankful for the Lord's patience and graciousness to me through those days, humbling my heart and crushing my self-righteousness over time to understand that I did not achieve my own salvation and that other people need to be extended the same mercy that I received when someone shared the gospel with me. At 19, I realized I couldn't carry my faith by my own willpower anymore and I needed a church to learn and be, be, uh, be discipled. By God's sovereignty, I ended up at a Korean Presbyterian church that hired a master seminary grad to teach their English ministry. Uh, the growth of my sanctification found a fresh footing under his discipling and the rest is history. I resisted baptism for a long time because I thought that it was a ritualistic construct of organized religion that had no meaning because it was an, uh, or because it was an age-based rite of passage and not based on genuine belief. And that was true of my experience at the age of four. And it was true for how baptism was handled by the Presbyterian leadership of my old church. Uh, I'm getting baptized today because I now see baptism for its, uh, for its design in scripture. I'm getting baptized today to be obedient to Jesus' command to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as a physical representation of the rebirth that occurred in my heart 16 years ago. Because of your profession of faith in Christ alone for salvation, Christian, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Jane Zwicky, and I would like to boast in our Lord. I went to church ever since I could remember. Our church was a Korean Presbyterian church. I was what the Koreans would call a multashinang. It means born a Christian. I was born into a church attending family, so after a time it was just assumed by everyone that I was a believer. My parents baptized me as an infant. I was raised with all the Bible stories and participated in children's skits, but any hint of the gospel that was taught was usually obscured by the teachings of blessings for the saved. So I left for college with a belief in a God that I invented to be abundantly merciful and without any judgment who required nothing of me. College was a time filled with fleshly and sinful behaviors. The lack of parental oversight, the amount of free time, the easy access to liquor, drugs, and attention from boys all gave way to um, sin that continued to descend into further darkness. When my conscience would strike in my heart and threaten guilt or shame, my false god and I were able to excuse and rationalize any actions. At some point in the second trimester, Second semester of my sophomore year, I could no longer reconcile my worldly behavior with my invented image of God. Even by my own standards, I could not consider myself a good person. Could God really forgive? 
all my sins if I had nothing good to even show or bargain with? It struck fear in my heart. So I attempted to remedy my position. This time I created a false religion that under the guise of Christianity, good works would help me draw the favor of the Lord. I joined a campus ministry and even went on two short-term missions. But these actions were simply a way to quell my disturbed and guilty mind while I desperately clung to the things of the world, such as idolizing money, consumption of worldly entertainment, and even an ungodly relationship I had flippantly entered. After graduation, my parents opened a restaurant and asked me to look after my sisters, both of whom were still in school and unable to drive. I took on this task incredibly unhappily. The relationship I had with a worldly man began to sear my conscience the more consistently I attended ch weekly church um, services and sat under the preaching of a master's seminary grad that my childhood Presbyterian church had mistakenly and accidentally hired. <laughs> in the relationship, in my relationship, when I was asked to share what it is I exactly believed in, I realized I could not even coherently explain. I didn't know what I believed. It dawned on me that I had never properly read the Bible. So I began to read the book of Numbers. I figured I had read a bit of Genesis, a bit of Exodus, and Leviticus had a reputation as boring. Um, so I read the book of Numbers. Upon reading, I found that the first chapters had such clear expectations of the duties of the Levites, the way the camp was to be set up, to throw out uncleanness, and how Passover was to be celebrated. These were the steps and measures the Israelites needed to take to approach a holy God so as not to be killed on the spot. And for the first time, I understood just how holy God was. It was there, clear as day on the pages. His character of holiness and righteous as, as righteous judge displayed for me to see. And then there were the Israelites, who after seeing the wonders of God had unending grumblings and complaints. Seeing them in their pitiful dying state in the wilderness, I sat there growing confused and indignant towards them. But was I any better? I quickly recognized that my heart was the same, hateful towards God, rebellious, discontent, angry, ungrateful, and proud. Around this time, our pastor was preaching through the book of Mark. We were towards the end of Mark, around chapters 14 and 15, and the gospel was being preached repeatedly. He always ended his sermons with a plea that those who are unsaved must turn to Christ as our only hope. His pleas that, were, that once used to bother me and make me seethe now render my thoughts quiet and somber. My mind recalled verses such as John 3.16 and John 3.5.8. At this point, I firmly believed in the resurrection of Christ, but I knew I was not born again. I faced the fact that I was an unbeliever, something I avoided addressing for a long time. I knew of Christ, but I did not know Christ. I had not submitted to Christ, I, so I didn't know what to do except continue to read his word, to learn as much as I could about him, and pray to him for salvation in hopes that he would hear an unbeliever's prayer. There was no better way to summarize my desperation at the time than the words of Mark 9, 24, I believe, help my unbelief. I am not sure exactly when the Lord blessed my life with such undeserved salvation, but I believe it was around this time in the spring of 2017. I had become convicted of my sinfulness and brokenness. There was no good in me, and I was incapable of anything good. I truly understood for the first time that my only hope in approaching a holy and just God was through Christ who died on the cross and paid the wages of my sin. I repented of my sins and begged the Lord for a new heart like the one he talked about and promised in Ezekiel 36. I asked that my heart would hate sin the way he does and that I would love his commandments and love his ways. I was desperate to know whether I received salvation or not, but without any assurance, I could only grip the Bible tighter to my chest in hopes that something had changed. So slowly over time, my heart did begin to change. Um, things that once brought me pleasure pleased me no more. I ended the worldly relationship. My heart of service to my family began to change. The use of my language changed. I truly craved and hungered to know more about God, so I dedicated myself to the discipleship of my pastor and became further involved with our English ministry. 
Until our pastor went over a sermon regarding a believer's assurance of salvation a couple of months later, I had still been unsure whether the Lord had granted me salvation. And for the first time, I felt a profound wave of peace, joy, and awe wash over me. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of the Lord. My life had been marked by enmity with, with God, but the Lord in his grace and mercy, mercy has found it to be pleasing to him to pluck me from the wide road that leads to hell. How wonderful to know that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Romans 5, 10 through 11. Praise be to the good Lord, our God who saves. I am getting baptized today because my last baptism was done out of assumption that I was born a believer and out of a man-made tradition at our church at the age of 16 when I was not actually a believer. I wish to make a public declaration in front of you all that the Lord has mercifully and graciously saved me and that I have been reborn through faith in Jesus Christ and believe in the gospel of my message of God with my whole heart. Thank you. Jane, because of your profession of faith in Christ alone for salvation, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Garrett Butcher, come tell us what God has done for you. Good morning. My name is Garrett Butcher, and this is the testimony of how my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ opened my eyes to my own depravity and gave me a repentant heart with the desire to pursue godliness and to the glory of God alone. As far back as memory permits, I can recall growing up in a lifestyle based around going to a Christian church, being involved in various ministries, and participating in activities that were organized by the churches I have attended. My life had been set on this path by my loving parents who desired to see me grow up in an environment where I learned about God and his plans for those who follow him, as well as being set apart from the rest of the world that did not desire to follow the principles set forth in the Bible. As I got older, I continued to cultivate a basic knowledge of the stories and passages taught to me in Sunday school and student ministries, and even in the occasional time when I went to adult church with my parents. Yet as time went on, I wanted to obtain more than just the basic knowledge and repetitive messages that had been taught in my life so far and get to the point where I could truly tell others that I was a Christian, not because of how I'd been raised, but because of my own affirmation of belief and faith. Roughly 11 years ago, I wanted to pro proclaim my beliefs before the church. My family and I were attending by getting baptized. I went through all the steps. I affirmed that Jesus Christ died and rose again to save me from my sin. I took the baptism class and I was baptized at the age of 13 after service on a Sunday morning. However, I did not have a true understanding of where I stood before God with my sin, and repentance was something that I did if I was afraid of being called out on my sin or feeling that I was simply not living the perfect Christian life. This misunderstanding of the Christian faith polluted my way of thinking. It led me to believe that I would be forgiven by God if I confessed that I knew what I did was wrong and continue to live a Christian lifestyle, all the while still deliberately committing acts of sin. As I entered high school, I noticed new areas of sin that I had never experienced before, and the perfect Christian life that I had tried so hard to work for seemed to stray farther away, and the self-appointed task of confessing sin happened less and less over time. 
While still living the Christian lifestyle, I didn't feel like I was learning anything from Sunday sermons anymore. I didn't feel like I was set apart from the world, and I engaged in a pattern of unrepentant sin that controlled my thoughts, my desires, and my life. Around the end of high school, my dad got deeper into the Word of God than he ever had before, and through a string of decisions, my family left the church we had been attending for 14 consecutive years and sought to pursue a church that followed biblical instruction more faithfully and did not leave our faith stagnant as our previous church had. God was gracious enough to lead our family to a church, to a church that had a solid foundation on the inerrant truths of the Bible and pastoral leadership that taught the word in an expository manner to share the gospel truthfully. Yet while the confidence of being in a faithful church put many worries to rest in my own heart, I was still living in unrepentant sin and living with an apostate faith. The next few years of attending a faithful church taught me many new things about scripture that I'd never learned before and reformed my thinking on things that had been taught incorrectly in the past. I began to believe that the image of perfect Christianity that I had pursued in the past was within reaching distance once again, but I was still clinging on to my sin or refusing to repent due to a fear of what people around me would think or say. After attending community college part-time for the past few years, I decided I want to transfer to Arizona State University to pursue a bachelor's degree, and in January of 2020, I moved to the Valley to start my next level of education. As part of the process of moving up here, I wanted to find a church I could regularly attend and that held the same basic beliefs as the church I was attending before. And through a recommendation from my own church and the gift of the Master Seminary Church Finder, I was led to Grace Bible Church. I quickly fell in love with the environment surrounding Grace Bible Church, and I can clearly see that this was a body of believers that genuinely cared for glorifying God and the spiritual growth of each other. Unfortunately, soon after I started attending, I started being less disciplined in attending GBC, and I eventually stopped coming altogether. I went back home after the semester and didn't really think about much about attending GBC until I came back for the fall semester. When I came back to school, I started attending GBC more frequently and started building the self-discipline to not stay up late Saturday night and wake up in time to go to church on Sunday. Around the same time, I started fostering relationships specifically within the 414 ministry and made new friends that are very near and dear to my heart. Through these connections, I started to engage more often with others and desired to gain a stronger bond through showing up to more events and meetings. On Friday, April 16th of 2021, I joined some of the young men to have our bi-weekly coffee meeting and have a general discussion about how God was working in our lives. That morning, the, the topic of discussion was how our unrepentance led us farther from God and how God used that to help us understand how much wretched sinners such as us needs the saving grace of Jesus Christ. While the other young men around the table discussed how they struggled with unrepentance and how God had opened their eyes to their sin, I stayed quiet and thought to myself that I could not genuinely say that I never repented in such a way to believe that I was truly saved from my sin. As everyone around the table finished with their discussion, a silence settled. Silence settled over the room while I was being shattered internally. Then by the grace of God, I found the strength to proclaim true repentance before God and the young men around me and apologize for living in fear for what people might say if they knew about the wretch I truly was. I'm completely undeserving of the grace given to me by God and those men who I'm now proud to call my brothers. And as of that day, I can say that I have the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. I now understand that being a Christian comes not from my own works, achievements, or from living a Christian lifestyle and simply going through the motions. A relationship with God comes from the gift of sanctification through Jesus Christ to all who place their dependence of salvation on him. I stand before you all now with that same blessed assurance to publicly proclaim through baptism that I will devote the rest of my life to praise God in all that he has done and share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ that he gave to one so undeserving such as I. All glory be to Christ.
Jared. Because of me. Because of your profession of faith in Christ, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Steph Pagel, come tell us what God has done for you. Hi, my name is Steph Pagel, and I am here to tell you about how God, being rich in mercy, showed his love to me and saved me by his grace. I grew up in a Christian home and attended a Bible teaching church my entire life. I went to a Christian school from preschool through high school, and overall, I lived a very sheltered life. One thing I remember my parents making very clear to me when I was young was that just because I went to church, a Christian school, and because they believed in the Lord, that did not make me a Christian. Because of this, I never grew up with a false sense of hope and thinking that I was saved based on outward merit. I grew up with a strong conscience and was definitely a people pleaser, so rule following wasn't something that was hard for me. I had a tenderness to the things of the Lord when I was young, but never knew how to have a relationship with the Lord. I don't remember the gospel being preached to me while growing up, and maybe that was just because I didn't have ears to hear. If anything, I grew in head knowledge and not heart knowledge. I wanted to be saved, but I didn't know how to be. When I was maybe eight or nine, I remember a verse being read at church, which was Philippians 1.6. It says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I knew that salvation was a good work, that we need to begin with the Lord, and so I just hoped that he would work that in me in time. I prayed for that. Around the same time, I became terrified of hell. I was terrified that I would go to hell and I wanted to do everything I possibly could to not go there. But salvation isn't about not wanting hell. It's about wanting Christ, and my heart wasn't there. I remember a conversation with my dad, and he encouraged me to read my Bible every day. I think I made it through Genesis and Exodus and then stopped reading. Fast forward to junior high and high school, I went through a number of Bible classes at my school that I loved. I spent five years studying the Old and New Testament, church history, taking an apologetics class, an ethics and worldview class, and spent an entire year studying different doctrine. During the year we studied doctrine, the only assignment in that class was to read through the Bible in that school year and to write down the different doctrines we saw in scripture while we read. It was the first time in my life that I was in the word more thoroughly. During this season, I believe the Lord began working in my heart. When I was a sophomore in high school, my sister and best friend had both been saved and wanted to be baptized. I did everything with these two, and I remember not being happy at all when they told me they wanted to be baptized. I didn't want to be. But because we did everything together, I decided to go through the motions and be baptized as well. I filled out the baptism questionnaire that my church required, and because I grew up in church, I knew the right answers to write down, but I truly do not believe I was saved at this point. I do believe during the following years my heart began to change. I went through a church split during my senior year of high school that completely turned my world upside down. Most of the teachers at my school had attended that church with me. And because my family was one of the only ones to leave, that impacted my school experience as well. I was treated differently and lost relationships with people I had known my entire life. I remember struggling watching such disunity amongst believers, and I couldn't wrap my mind around this. This drove me to scripture, and I would spend my lunch breaks reading the word and finding comfort in the Lord. I realized that my hope could only be in God, that he was unchanging, sees everything in my life, and he cares for his people. Looking back, I can see the Lord's kindness to me in that season. He brought me new godly friends, led me to new churches that had such humble leadership and care for their people, and ultimately, I met my husband. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called, in, called according to his purpose. God used that trial for my ultimate good. God continues to grow me, reveal sin to me, and draw me closer to himself. I struggled with assurance of salvation for years. I was always afraid that I would deceive myself into believing that I was saved and not truly be saved. It was during another difficult season that the Lord, the, the Lord showed me what I deserved, and that was nothing. He owes me nothing. What I do deserve is hell, and yet he gave me salvation through Jesus' death on the cross. This reality humbled me. Salvation is a gift from the Lord. 
If I was going to find assurance of salvation in anything that I had done, I would never find assurance. It was during this season that I realized that my, my salvation was a gift and I can rest assured because of his character and goodness to me and not because of anything I could ever do. Over the years that followed, God continued to sanctify me. When I started attending Grace Bible Church, a phrase I heard constantly was to preach the gospel to yourself every day and that you never graduate from the gospel. And this couldn't be more true. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. To think of myself rightly before a holy God will give me a gratitude and love for what the Lord has done for me. He has saved me from my biggest issue and concern, and that is my sin. I could never stand before a holy God on my own merit. I deserve judgment and wrath for my sin, and I need a substitute. God, in his great compassion for his people, sent that substitute, and that is Jesus. My faith is in him alone, and because of his death on the cross, I can now but stand before God forgiven. I've been given the righteousness of Christ. God has blessed me with five kids, and my heart for their salvation is huge. Preaching the gospel to them has given me a new love for the gospel. Faith is a gift from the Lord, and as I tell my kids, if you have Christ, you have everything. As I get to preach the gospel to them, I am reminded myself of what I have been saved from and to. James 1, 2-4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God is currently growing me through a new trial and revealing areas of sin to me that I would not have seen had I not been in the midst of a trial. I was encouraged to not only pray that God would remove my trial, but to pray for endurance for as long as God had me in it. I refused to pray that way. I didn't want to pray for endurance for something that I did not want. I was bitter that the Lord would take my health from me. I felt unseen and forgotten by the Lord. Trials have a way of humbling me before the Lord, and this trial has done just that. I'm learning to trust that God knows all things, especially when I don't, that he is always near even when I don't feel it, that he is worthy to be trusted. His character is a constant and does not change based on any circumstance that comes my way. It's not about my circumstances or trials. And God is after my heart and my holiness, and he knows what my heart needs most. I was discouraged watching the ways my heart responded to the Lord in this trial, the way I doubted his character and love for me. I'm constantly reminded that I still need the gospel just as much today as I did in years past. I will never graduate from the gospel. A.W. Pink wrote, the apprehension of God's infinite knowledge should fill the Christian with adoration. The whole of my life stood open to his view from the beginning. He foresaw my every fall, my every sin, my every backsliding. Yet, nevertheless, fixed his heart upon me. I praise the Lord for fixing his heart upon me, for sending his son Jesus to die for my sins, that I can turn from my sin, repent, and be forgiven by the Lord. I have talked about getting rebaptized for a few years now, knowing that I wasn't saved when I was baptized the first time. So today I want to be baptized again to proclaim what God has done for me and how he has continued to show his faithfulness to me. Steph, it is my privilege, based on your testimony of faith in Christ, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Joshua Rosas, come tell us about your Savior. Hello, my name is Joshua Rosas. I am 26 years old. I was born in Salinas, California as a first generation Mexican American. Spanish is my first language, not having learned to speak English until a few weeks into kindergarten. Throughout my infancy, I lived with my mother and her parents in Soledad, California, about 25 miles south of Salinas. 
I remember my grandparents being devout churchgoers and were a part of the local Spanish-speaking Pentecostal church. My mom, grandparents, and myself would attend church regularly. My grandparents were the primary Christian influencers at that time. At age seven, my parents moved my younger brother and I to Summerton, Arizona, a small agricultural town about 10 miles from the Mexican border. Shortly after moving, my mom began attending a local Spanish-speaking Pentecostal church in the area. Throughout my middle school and high school years, I became good friends with the people at the church youth group and eventually became involved with the worship team, learning how to play guitar and bass and learning to run the soundboard. During this time, I became a devout churchgoer, never missing a service because of the responsibilities that were laid on me and because the youths of the church had become such good friends of mine. During this time, I religiously attended church, not because of a love for the Lord or because I knew church to be a means of God's grace in my life, but because I liked to play music and because I had good friends there. At 18, I started a new chapter in my life as a college student. I was exposed to a lot of different people during the dorm life of my first year at a liberal secular university. I made a lot of very good friends during this first year, both Christian and non-Christian. By God's grace, the Christian friends that I made that year were zealous, born-again believers who had a passion for Jesus and his gospel. To them, faith in Christ was not just an identity thing like it was for me. To them, their faith in Christ was everything. My friend, my Christian friends, Edgar, Victor, and Peter, who were a few years older than me, lived to see the gospel advanced on that college campus. God used these men in his pursuit of me. To these young men, I was not just another college student, but I was a soul who needed Christian fellowship. These men would invite me to church, they would invite me to on-campus Bible studies, and they would invite me to random hangouts with other Christians where testimonies and adventures in on-campus evangelism were shared. They didn't know it at the time, and neither did I, but I wasn't a Christian during this first year of college and the time before that. And this became apparent about two weeks into summer break between my first and second years of college. Like the summers before, I was working as an agricultural laborer at the vineyard that my grandpa worked for decades. A few weeks into the summer job, I remember one day working apart from the labor crew at about 1 or 2 p.m. in the afternoon when I began to reminisce on my first year as a college student. I remember all the fun times with the new friends that I had made, but then I remember the times that I spent specifically with Edgar, Victor, and Peter. I specifically remember their character and their obvious love for God and the gospel of his son, Jesus. That day, I remember feeling a sense of guilt for professing to know Christ on the outside, yet having no concern for holiness or love for him on the inside. Up to that point in my life, I had no love or passion for the good news of salvation that the believer has in Christ. And I had no, and I had no desire to turn away and repent from sin. That moment was the first time that I had felt convicted for my sin. I was grieved over my hypocrisy that day. I remember praying a few moments after that, acknowledging that after acknowledging that conviction, I remember I remember asking God to help me turn from my hypocritical life, a life of professing to know the Lord and Savior of the world, yet not knowing Him at all. I asked God that day if He would teach me how to walk like his son Jesus walked, like the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, which reads, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. After that prayer in that hot summer afternoon in that vineyard, and for the rest of that summer, I began to read my Bible with the intent of knowing God and knowing how to walk with him. 
It was that summer that my love for the Savior and hatred for sin began to grow. When that summer ended and my second year of college began, God graciously gave me the conviction to find and to serve at a local church. I ended up becoming a member of Journey Christian Fellowship, the church where Edgar and Peter attended and served. It was at this church where I learned to read my Bible, to share the gospel, to fight sin, to live the Christian life, and to use chapsticks because it was a Korean Baptist church. So, so in conclusion, today after seven years from that summer, when I was first convicted of my sin, and I was graciously given the desire to turn from my sins and believe that Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of my sins, I stand before you all as a brother in Christ. I can say with the psalmist, blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. I could say with my fellow believers that I am a new creation and the old in me has passed away and the new has come. I can say with confidence before you today that I have placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for the forgiveness of my sins, and that he has given me the desire to turn away and repent for my sin continually. And because of this, I desire to be baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in obedience to our Lord and our Savior. Thanks. Thank you. Josh, it is my privilege, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't you just love hearing the ways that God saves sinners? A signed baseball glove, a faithful sermon, book of numbers, godly parents, faithful friends. It's just thrilling. It, it rekindles in us our own first love as we hear those, doesn't it? You think about your own vows before the Lord. I want to follow Jesus. It's an encouragement to all of us for evangelism. You, you hear God using means to save sinners, opening our mouths with the gospel, telling people about Christ when they don't want to hear it and telling them about Christ again. It's an encouragement to all of us with all of the kids in this room. You heard about kids growing up in church and hearing the truth faithfully proclaimed. And there's an army of kids in here that need Christ. Maybe it's making you think for the first time, I thought I was a Christian. I don't know Christ the way these know Christ. What a great opportunity in the long chain of disciples who make disciples who make disciples. What an opportunity in God's kindness to you this morning to hear these very words, to see these lives, trophies of God's grace transformed by the gospel. Uh, this could be a day of salvation for those who hear. Let's pray for these who just got baptized and then John's gonna come up and walk us through church membership. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for these trophies of your grace, these who have experienced new birth. They have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son, into light and life and hope and joy. Thank you for their courage and their clear testimonies. We pray that these testifyings of your grace would be on their lips all their days. And would you be pleased to draw many people to yourself through their lives, through their words, through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Wow, such a sweet service. I mean, I was sitting there listening to so many of our brothers and sisters boast in the Lord, and um, my heart was, my mind was turning toward Psalm 70, verse 4. I want to read this to you for a second. David writes, let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. I mean, how sweet is that? 
to think that, um, you know, as we're hearing these testimonies, we're hearing, as Smed just mentioned, I mean, this is something that only God could do. You know, it's so, it's, it's, it's one thing to hear about somebody maybe born into a, a religious home or a false religion or um, no religion or biblical Christianity and then maybe making some changes and maybe um, changing behaviors or adopting some convictions. And then it's another thing to hear of um, eight people spiritually dead, made alive uh, in a regenerative way, just supernatural power on display. Uh, only God gets glory for something like spiritual salvation. And uh, so it's just so sweet. And I want to thank everybody who testified. Thank you for boasting in Christ. You know, it's interesting when God saves, especially in our culture, it's kind of, well, it's, it's easy to um, almost view that as something that just pertains to you. We have a society that really imbibes a rugged individualism. And there's something profound about the way God has designed the church, the way he's purchased the church, the way he's created the church for individuals who are saved by God's grace to live in community with one another. And um, it's important to remember that. We're going to have the privilege here this, this morning of welcoming 31 souls into the membership at Grace Bible Church. And that's a profound reality, and it's a profound responsibility. And I want to just remind you of a few facts, and for some, this might be a, a new and important um, um, thought, that church membership, you know, membership is not a, a biblical term, but it's absolutely a biblical doctrine. And what, what's happening here is we have saints who are, who are obeying the command to believe the gospel. Because you remember, the first time the gospel was preached in the dawn of the, of the church age would have been Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. And he says, repent um, and be, each one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and separate yourself or be saved from a perverse culture. So responding to the gospel is a separation from a perverse culture, an unbelieving world, and a joining oneself to the church. And so it's actually really important to remember that as we think about baptism, that this is, it's not, conversion isn't just, great, I got saved and now I've got insurance about eternity. It's, no, there's been an absolute transferal of identity from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I'm going to live in community with the people of God. This is my family. Uh, we have the same spiritual DNA. And I want to read to you a verse that explains this in a really helpful way. I've, I'm very fond of the way Paul introduces the concept in, in his first epistle to the Corinthians. And I'm just going to read to you chapter 1, verse 2. And I want you to listen to how Paul describes the church, and particularly those who are in the church. Listen to this verse. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And so in one verse, you have the reality that, first of all, people who are a part of the church are those who have been sanctified in a positional sense, and they are saints by calling, not saints because they've arrived at a position of holiness yet, but they are saints here on earth because God has made them holy. And he had starts by, by saying this to the church that is at Corinth. So in other words, as Paul thinks about church, he doesn't think about a bunch of rogue lone ranger christians going around doing their own thing he thinks man we've got saints at corinth because they're part of the church that's at corinth <laughs> and there's a church there and they're recognized as members of that church part of that church and they along with all of the saints in every place where the people of god gather are saints who have been called and so it's very helpful to remember that of course regeneration happens before church membership would be recognized in, a, in an external official capacity like it is now. Um, these people have been regenerated and uh, are walking with Christ and um, want to testify to that. Uh, some just testified that in their baptism and some have moved here and they've already been baptized and they want to be part of the people of God. But the, the New Testament doesn't really recognize Lone Ranger Christians running around doing their own thing. Christians identify with the people of God. 
And so that's what's so sweet about church membership as the, the, the biblical side of church membership. And before I read this list of names, I want to remind you who are members, remember this is, this is every bit our responsibility. You know, these dear saints, these brothers and sisters in Christ are joining themselves to this body. And so, you know, I just try to remind myself whenever I uh, you know, do a membership uh, interview and we pray, I just remember, pray for our, us as a church that we would be the body of Christ to these individuals. So as they come forward, we're going to have an opportunity to read the um, membership, the covenant of membership. And so we're going to, all the members are going to read that together with our new members. And so it's a reminder of, of our responsibility for all of us who are members of Grace Bible Church. All right, so I'm going to call these names and... Um, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. I'm just going to pronounce it with as much confidence as I can. So if I slaughter it, it'll sound, for people who don't know how to pronounce your name, they'll be impressed. But otherwise, hopefully I get your name right. As I call your name, just go ahead and come on up to the front here. If you can just line up along um, on the front, of the front of the stage here, and you can just come up front and then turn around and face the, uh, the congregation, that would be great. Landon and Laura Armstrong. Nolan and Amber Baum. Terry Caruso, Michaela Dudley, Preston Fuller, Cassandra Giese, Judith Heddens, Maria Hornack, Wendy Mahaffey, John and Hillary McCoy, Deborah Morton Bade, Courtney Parkinson, Jackie Roberts, Nate and Susie Snow, Dennis and Sandy Toon, Denis Terubiate, Terrell and Cheryl, uh, sorry, ter Terry and Cheryl Williams, Debbie Wise, Mackenzie York, Stephanie Behar, Garrett Butcher, Joel and Jolene Smades, Christian and Jane Zwicky. All right. That's a good problem to have, not enough space for all of the new members. Yeah, we can ask, maybe we can, everybody can just kind of step about uh, four carpet squares, maybe make it eight, make, make, make it six carpet squares to the left there. That'd be great. Okay. Man, God in His grace, this is such a such an incredible, incredible thing. Um, I want to go ahead and hopefully, hopefully everybody can at least see a, some other fellow member of Grace Bible Church. So sorry, we we're kind of running out of space there. All right, I want to ask all of uh, all of the members, uh, current and new new members will remain standing. Current members, go ahead and stand, and we're going to uh, read uh, the covenant of membership together. And so, uh, new, new members, if you, hopefully you can see it on the back. If it's too small for you, you can go ahead and turn around and it's a little bit bigger behind you. Um, so we won't judge you um, on your eyesight, depending on whether, which direction you're facing. But hopefully you'll be able to see one side or the other. So let's read this together. Humbly trusting that God has graciously brought us to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having been baptized upon our profession of faith, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in dependence upon God's gracious help, solemnly enter into covenant with one another. We will pray for and be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the church, being a peacemaker with all in the church. We will walk together in brotherly love exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, faithfully encouraging, admonishing, and treating one another as occasion may require, seeking with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows, being slow to take offense and quick to forgive and reconcile with one another. We will strive for the advancement of this church for Christ's sake by not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, by remaining faithful to God's word concerning our biblical doctrines, church discipline, the Lord's table, and believer's baptism, 
by exercising the spiritual gifts given to us as members of the body of Christ, by giving cheerfully and sacrificially to support the gospel ministry of the church as it extends both into this community and the nations. We will seek to live boldly as witnesses for Jesus Christ where God has placed us, living a transformed life and proclaiming the gospel that the mission of Jesus Christ might advance in this world. We will persevere in raising our children under God's watchful care that they might, by his grace, repent and believe in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. We will, if we move from this church as soon as possible, unite with another local church where we can obediently live under God's word in fellowship and where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant in the body of Christ. All right. Well, I'm going to ask new members to remain standing, stay up front. Everyone else can take a seat. Before, um, before we end here, we are going to close in a song. I'm going to ask the new members to stay for just a second because even as the uh, team comes up to lead us in one last song, I want to go ahead and invite the elders to go ahead and make their way up and to just greet everybody very quickly uh, in a very quick fashion during this song. And I want to encourage you during our um, lunch together to look out for these new members, welcome them into the body. All right.